The sitting is resumed. It is time for a question to the Minister of Health and Social Services and Public Safety. We will start with listed questions. Before I call Mr Beggs, I have to inform the House that question 7 has been withdrawn. Mr Beggs. Question number 1. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I understand the stress and strain that being on a waiting list will have meant for many people. The allocation of an additional £40 million from the November monitoring round will begin to address issues with waiting lists. Since November, significant efforts have been made across health and social care within a very tight time frame to secure additional outpatient clinics and treatments within trusts and to put in place appropriate arrangements with independent sector organisations to transfer suitable patients for assessment and or treatment. Additional funding is being targeted at those who have been waiting the longest. I want to see the, wait, the number of patients that can be assessed and treated quickly, effectively and safely maximised. Broadly, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, this investment will benefit between 60,000 and 70,000 patients who would otherwise be waiting. Call Mr Beggs for a supplementary. Over the past three years for which figures are available for those waiting more than 18 weeks, the figures for White Abbey have jumped from 151 to some 2,159, and from Antrim from 372 to 3,741. But transforming your care was to empower our GPs so that they could carry out more specialist works uh, within the locality of, of their uh, services. Could the Minister advise how he has prioritised capital expenditure and encouraged uh, GP specialism so that more pressure, more, more uh, treatment can occur locally to relieve the, the huge pressure, the unacceptable pressure that exists on patients not being treated in, in the appropriate time at our hospitals? I, I, as I said in my, my answer, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I don't think that uh, waiting longer than 18 weeks is, is an acceptable position to be in. Uh, I don't think those are acceptable numbers. I, I, I don't uh, dispute the argument that anybody would put around that. I don't think it was acceptable either, and I know the member will agree with me, um, that um, some the actions or inactions of some in this House were costing Northern Ireland's public purse, uh, have, did cost Northern Ireland's public purse uh, £150 million, and if half of that, which is roughly the allocation of the budget that goes to health, had it went to health, we would have been able to uh, keep um, waiting lists under some degree of control. Uh, there has been a, a, a some nearly 14 per cent increase in the number of referrals um, for appointments over the last five years, which has obviously had an impact on that. Um, we have, and, and the member is right to highlight the, um, the, the important role that GPs and pr primary care can actually play in addressing uh, need at its earliest stage. Um, and you know, I am, and you asked about investment that has gone in in terms of capital capital priorities. Uh, the member may be aware that um, the department has this year been seeking to invest around £10 million through a scheme to modernise GP surgeries, uh, and that is money that is starting to get out onto the ground. There are a number of GP surgeries which are modernising as a result of that money that's going in. He will also be aware of the investment that has been started to roll out in terms of investment in primary care centres. Um, so, for example, the primary care centre in Ballymena. Uh, is soon to uh, is, has been built the one in Bambridge, which I think is officially opening tomorrow. Um, which is a, an absolutely I've had a chance to see around that centre before it opened, an absolutely fantastic centre where people can get treatments closer to to their home, closer to their their local community, and not have to necessarily always go into uh, hospitals elsewhere. So there has been investment has been going on, Mr. President. I also think there are huge opportunities with GP federations, and I'm keen to to see what we can do to work with those to, to uh, again, uh, increase capacity at the primary care level. I call Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, could I welcome the Minister's um, uh, comments so far? Um, could I ask the Minister, uh, is he aware of the, the press coverage suggesting that the £40 million on the waiting lists isn't being spent? And could he maybe um, outline uh, what the £40 million is actually purchasing in, in terms of assessments and procedures? I am aware of, of, of um, some coverage in the press and indeed comment by, by some members of this House questioning the, the impact of the, the investment of the £40 million. Um, as I said in my, my answer, th this will it is actually much better in terms of the impact than I originally thought it was going to be. It is going to be around 60 to 70,000 people 
uh, who would otherwise have been waiting longer will, will be getting the benefit of this in, in investment. And, and when we're, we're thinking about this, we need to bear in mind and consider the fact that there has been a very tight time scale for uh, the board and trusts and also the independent sector to gear up and to be ready to, to spend this investment. Um, the long delay in resolving issues around welfare reform meant that the finance minister, the then finance minister, wasn't able to come to this house until uh, November to announce uh, a monitoring round outcome. Um, but we have been working assiduously since that outcome where we got £40 million for waiting lists to ensure that that is being spent where it is meant to be spent, which is getting people off the waiting list, getting people the treatments uh, that they need. And we've done that in two different ways. One has been to try to increase capacity in-house, so within uh, our health and social care sector. So there is some of the investment that will ensure that there will be around 9,000 more in- and outpatient uh, appointments. There will be about 13,000 more uh, diagnostic tests going on, and there will be about 15,000 more uh, appointments with allied health professionals, and that's inside the system. But obviously, and members will appreciate and understand, although some have obviously opposed the use of the independent, I think wrongly opposed the use of the independent sector, um, that we have had to go to them to ensure that that money can be can be maximised. And that is that is, uh, um, Mr. We, we, Mr. Speaker, we have awarded for outpatient appointments some 27,000 outpatient appointments, some 15. Thousand of those have already been referred, and in terms of inpatient appointments for procedures and so forth, uh, 8,000 have been awarded, uh, 5,500 have already been referred. So, even in a very tight timescale, with all of the strictures of that, uh, we are doing a good job in getting this money spent where it's meant to be spent, helping people in Northern Ireland. Before I call Mr. John Dallet, uh, can I remind the Minister about the two minute rule? Mr. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for, for his answer. And would the Minister agree with me that in a perfect world, waiting lists really should be something that does not exist for a number of reasons? The Causeway Hospital, for example, uh, saw a record number of people over Christmas in the A&E and admitted a record number of people. Yet in the local press, they are castigated because they have got a waiting list. Would the Minister agree with me that a waiting list is no solution to a problem and only damages good people who are working in tremendous, uh, stressful conditions? Well, in, in a perfect world, lots of things would be, would be much better, but we are not, we're not in a perfect world. We have to uh, live with the restraints that we face inside the system that we have. And, and even, even though we obviously are operating in a less than perfect or ideal world, uh, the Executive has again uh, underscored its commitment to health and social care by giving it the, the best budget, set, budget settlement of any department within the Northern Ireland Executive, increasing expenditure next year by around £130 million, which is an increase of, of 3 per 3%. And that obviously comes at the expense of, of other departments who so have to make sacrifices, and I'm, I'm um, always conscious of, of that fact. Um, and, and look, I, mean, I, I would like to see, as I, I've said to Mr Beggs in response to his, his initial question, I, I want to see waiting lists go down. Um, I think they are at unacceptably high levels, and people are having to wait too long. The £40 million pounds that I've uh, been able to invest um, is starting to make an impact, and some, some 50 to 70,000 or 60 to 70,000 people will see the benefit of, of that over the coming weeks, and some already have received the benefit of that. Um, I want to continue with that investment. I want to ensure that some of that increase that my department has received last year or for next year also goes into continuing to keep that momentum going so that we're continuing to address uh, that need that is there and that the member and his constituents will appreciate uh, is there. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think we, would, we had a situation over the last number of years where um, there were over 100,000 people waiting on waiting lists for uh, outpatient appointments whenever uh, and um, puts took, took office, and that number started to go down gradually over a period of time because of investments that were being made. Unfortunately, uh, those have headed back upwards, and that has in part been because of the, the inability to, to spend that money that was being lost through, through welfare reform fines. And it's a regrettable that we lost that. It's a pity that we lost that, uh, because that took the momentum out of that, that efforts that were being made to tackle it. But we need to start that momentum again, and I'm keen to do. Or I'm obviously very keen to do that, and will ensure that money is spent from the budget next year to do that. Call Mr. Ian Mill. Question number two. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the 4th of November, I outlined ambitious, far-reaching, and radical plans for transforming our health and social care system. 
I announced my intention to remodel the administrative structures of the health and social care system to make them more streamlined, reduce complexity and remove, bu remove bureaucracy. In short, I proposed that the Health and Social Care Board cease to exist and that its functions should transfer either to the Department, the Public Health Agency or the Health and Social Care Trusts. The Department would take firmer strategic control of the system. Trusts would have more responsibility for the planning of care in their areas and have the operational independence to deliver it. And the Public Health Agency would be retained with a renewed focus on prevention and early intervention. The consultation document entitled Health and Social Care Reform and Transformation Getting the Structures Right was published on 15 December 2015. The consultation to hear the public's views on these important issues uh, will run for eight weeks until 12 February. The Department will be working closely with the HSC colleagues, including those in the Board, in the coming months to define the best health and social care structures for Northern Ireland. Any decisions in respect of Health and Social Care Board staff will be part of this work. Call Mr. Milne for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answer thus far. Um, many of us have received letters from HSCB staff with concerns around the future uh, of their future location. Uh, can you confirm if a local focus on services will remain once these changes are in effect? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Principal, I'm, speaking, I'm, obviously, I'm conscious and, and aware of the impact that this has on, on staff, and that's why, um, particularly board staff, although this will mean change for, for staff right across the system, uh, it's not just the board who will be affected, but particularly obviously mindful of, of the impact on, on staff who are currently working within the board. And that's why, right from the very outset in, in announcing the reforms, as I did in, on the 4th of November, I made it absolutely clear that this was not in any way, shape, or form an intended uh, criticism of the staff who have worked in the board and who currently work on the board. Uh, and what it was actually about was about getting the structure within which they work um, right for Northern Ireland and right in the sense of trying to make the most of their talents. And I think we have a lot of really good people working right across health and social care whose, whose capacity, whose capabilities aren't maximised because of this overly bureaucratic system that we have in place. And I think that even though that some will be concerned about the changes that have been made, I have equally spoken to staff within the board who have agreed with the principles which I outlined that there is an overly bureaucratic system which gets in the way of, of innovation and gets in the way of, of making quick decisions. Um, now I obviously have to do that. Um, uh, if we could follow through with the decision to close the board, we'll have to do that in a way that is mindful of sensitivities around staffing issues and, and, and clearly um, many will be concerned about their jobs, but they are doing jobs that are important to the system. And if they are doing jobs that are important to the system, then those jobs will, will continue, whether they're working for the department or whether they're working for the PHA or whether they're working for trusts. The member mentioned locations of jobs, and again, I can understand concerns that some might have about, about moving, but moving from one, one location to another is something that happens quite frequently within the, the public sector, and that's obviously something that we would handle if required and if, if needed. Um, because obviously staff will have to work from some location, something that, again that we will, we will seek to handle in the most sensitive way in order to ensure that there is a minimum amount of disruption. Well, Mr. David Hilditch. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for the information he's given us so far. Uh, he's indicated there that he has spoken with staff. Uh, does the Minister believe that there is support from within the health and social care system uh, for the reforms that he's taken forward? <laughs> Mr. Milne mentioned um, some concerns expressed by, by board staff, and I, and I can absolutely understand and sympathise that the, the, fact that the, the staff who are most directly impacted on it might be somewhat concerned about how it impacts upon them personally. Um, but I have to say, in broad terms, right across the system, uh, since making the announcement back in, in November, I have met, uh, met nothing but support for the direction of travel that we are making. I think emphasised by the fact, and, and not, not just in terms of the trying to strip out and remove a layer of bureaucracy, which closing the board will do, but also the broader reforms, including the, the appointment of the expert panel under the chairmanship of, of Rafael Bengoa. Um, and we see that no more clearly than the report published, um, launched last week in this building by the Northern Ireland Confederation, an organisation of some 50 health care organisations, including organisations that are inside the health and social care system, who were encouraging every single one of us. They weren't just encouraging me, they were encouraging 
every one of us, every political party in this place to embrace the need to reform because they, better than us, they, better than anybody, understand the immensity of the challenges that our health and social care system is facing now and into the future. And they know that we need to change and we need to reform and we need to do things differently if we are to sustain the health and social care system that we have and to develop that and to ensure that our people get the best possible outcome. So they are encouraging us for change. So I, I have met nothing but support inside the system for the changes in the direction of travel that we're going. I think that the general public, while they may have some concerns um, about how it impacts on them as well, they know that we need to change as well, and I think most people out there do that. And I think the biggest challenge and the biggest barrier, and I'm on record in saying this before, Principal Deputy Speaker, are ourselves and, and whether or not political parties in this place who have sometimes not supported common sense reforms can embrace the need for change, which is being which is being suggested to us by those within the system. Call Mr. Michael McJimsey. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, in terms of the Health and Social Care Board, when I left, I established that when I left, there was 335 people working there. It's now somewhere over 600 that's been allowed to bloat by uh, roughly a factor of two. What I'm hearing from the Minister, I think, and he needs to, to, to clarify this, is that simply most of those bodies are going to be moved into the department. And what he's actually doing is creating hundreds of civil service jobs. Or am I missing something? Are they going somewhere else? How many are going to be civil servants in the future? How many civil service jobs, in fact, is he creating? I, I, think, I think the member is missing something. I don't think he's listening to answers that have been given in this House. In fact, the question he asked is very similar, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, to a question that was asked uh, my last question time. And, and the member, member tries to sort of inform the House that whenever he left, uh, and we all remember what he did towards the last of his um, time in office, and he will always be remembered as the minister who pulled the plug on the cancer centre and the radiotherapy unit at Alt McGelvin. We will always be remembered as the minister who took that decision. Um, in respect of, of the board, and, and, he, and he gains his quotes a figure about the number of staff that were there when he left. In 2010, which was whenever he was still in office, um, the, the figure in the board at that stage is 436. And yes, it, yes, it has increased. It has gone up. Um, but he was quoted in the Belfast Telegraph recently uh, at saying that he wanted this, the board with it, which he created, uh, which has been criticised inside the system, which has been criticised in the various reviews that we did, the commissioning review that flowed from the Donaldson report. He said that he wanted it to be a lean organisation. And he said, he quote, I said there should be a maximum of 250 staff. But after a lot of crying and wailing that they couldn't do it with that number of people, I allowed it to go to 350. We caved in pretty quickly and allowed them to increase the number of staff within the board by 100 whenever you were in office. Um, so, you know, he didn't take a lot of pressure from civil servants, caved in pretty quickly, allowed it to go up by 100, and then when he was leaving office, it was at 436. So, if, the bloat were, if there was any bloat in the organisation, any bloat in the board, it started under the member's tenure. In respect of, at the same time, Principal Deputy Speaker, the number of the departmental staff between 2010 and 2015 has gone down by a third. So we have, whilst there has been an increase in board staff, there has been a reduction in the departmental staff. And importantly, and this is what is important, between 2010 and 2015, a number of nursing, midwifery, professional and technical, social services, medical and dental and ambulance staff, those at the front line in health and social care in Northern Ireland, have gone up by 2,113 whole time equivalents. So this party has been investing in the front line and the staff who have been working on the front line helping Members people in Ireland, where the member was, was bloating the board when he was born. I, I again... I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. Order! Order! I again, remind them, I again remind the Minister about the two-minute rule. Call Ms Clare Sugden. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three. <laughs> Mr. Principal, let me speak. All registered residential care and nursing homes are required by legislation to employ an appropriate number of staff to enable them to meet the health and welfare needs of residents. The registered person and registered manager must ensure that enough staff of the appropriate skill level are on duty at all times to meet residents' assessed needs. RQIA has a responsibility to regulate, register and inspect a wide range of specified services delivered by HSC bodies and by the independent sector. I recognise that there are many challenges facing nursing recruitment in both the statutory and independent sectors which need to be addressed on a range of fronts. 
My department is taking forward a number of measures to address these. My department is developing a strategic approach to the future supply and demand of nursing in Northern Ireland that addresses the needs of both statutory and independent sectors, and which will take a long-term approach to workforce planning. We've just launched a return to practice campaign designed to encourage nurses in Northern Ireland who have been out of nursing practice to renew their registration and return to the profession so that they can make a valued contribution to the care of our local population. I provided funding for an additional 100 places on this return to practice programme to be delivered by Ulster University in the spring of 2016. This initiative will support the statutory and independent sectors. In addition, we have just launched a career pathway for nurses and midwives showcasing opportunities for development in a range of settings, including the independent sector. The career pathway has profiled the independent sector as a means of encouraging staff to apply for positions there. I am aware that the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency are continuing to work closely with independent sector providers to review the current workforce within private nursing homes. It is important to keep up to date with changes in patient complexity and to identify and develop competency levels of practice for senior care assistants and to explore the potential for maximising their role within nursing homes. for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I do appreciate that the Minister is looking towards addressing this. Um, I've been speaking with a number of providers, and they're telling me their big issue is that they just don't have enough um, nurses. Apparently, uh, for every one care home across Northern Ireland, there are actually one less nurse than what's necessary for health and safety. So, can I ask the Minister when he is actually going to start paying for provisions so that the people can actually get the care they're entitled to and that nurses will actually be encouraged into this role? Look, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the. Um, issues that there are with the, the, um, the sector. I, I met with the uh, IHCP independent health care providers just a, a couple of weeks ago, and whilst they wanted to discuss a, a, a range of issues, as you might, might anticipate, um, this was one of the issues that they wanted to particularly talk about. Uh, and I, and I, I, I wanted to listen to them and the concerns that they had, and just because we can all look at I can quote all sorts of figures, and people can quote figures back at me, but unless you're talking to providers, as the member has, you don't get a sense of what it actually means in, in the ground. Uh, and it was a an useful and interesting conversation, highlighting the fact that there is uh, a shortage uh, right across nursing, whether that's in the statutory sector, but particularly pronounced within the independent sector. Uh, and that's why we're trying to work. We're not just trying to work in terms of trying to get numbers up in the statutory sector where people might think that that would be our priority, but we realise and appreciate the importance of the independent sector and the work that they're doing. And we saw that um, particularly with uh, emergency departments and pressures that were faced over the, over the holiday period. So that's why the, the board and the PHA are trying to work very closely with both the strategy sector and the independent sector to increase the number of nurses. That's why we've done the return to practice campaign, which hopefully will bear some, bear some fruit. Um, but it is a challenge, and it's a challenge because um, and I, don't think, I think we need to be realistic and realize we can't wave a magic wand or, or click our fingers and make this uh, change overnight, because this is not just a, a Northern Ireland problem. It's not a British or UK problem. This is a worldwide problem in terms of a shortage of nurses. Um, so we need to be strategic and long-term in our thinking, but we also need to um, carry forward with some of those initiatives and indeed other initiatives that, that will increase the number of, of nurses coming out of our, 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 our universities. I have recently announced, I think I did it in the chamber just before Christmas, that I, I did not want to do away with the bursary um, to encourage uh, nurses to stay here and to train here, but I think it is also important that we also look in that context at ways in which we can keep our, our, particularly our newly qualified nurses in Northern Ireland practicing either in the statutory or the independent sector. Well, Ms. Juan Dobson. Principal Deputy Speaker, Minister, um, I met with management at Four Seasons last week and know the very real concerns they have with workforce recruitment. And on a personal note, I'm disappointed you turned down my invitation to Donna Cloney Nursing Home to see firsthand the work that's done there. So what help and reassurance can the Minister give to companies like this who wish to both invest in and care for our people, elder people in Northern Ireland before we see even more homes close? and the pain and the worry that that will bring? I, I don't need to accept the members' invites to, to know what is going on in residential care homes. I, I, I see plenty of them. Um, so I know what is going on, and I speak to, to people from the sector, including, including Four Seasons. I have met the chief executive of, of Four Seasons in a different capacity, but I am scheduled or I'm seeking to meet with them at a, as, a, as a company in the not-too-distant future. And obviously, we are still very, very concerned about their decision to, to close some of their homes. I welcome the fact that um, three of those homes, sadly the one in Garva, the sale on the one in Garva has fallen through, but thankfully three of the others are being sold. 
um, and uh, that will ensure that those, those uh, residents can remain in what has become their, their homes. And, and I do reflect on the fact that you know, a couple of months ago in this chamber, people were calling upon me to throw all sorts of money at some of these companies, knowing full well that the reason why they were closing, Four Seasons in particular were closing, was because of the, the very particular financial problems that they were experiencing. And the fact that I think three uh, of those homes have, are being sold um, to other providers shows that there was viability in those particular homes. Uh, look, I, 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 I understand the pressures that the system is facing. I understand the pressures that the sector is facing. And it is a critical part of our health and social care sector. I don't think in the past we have always given it the attention that it deserves. I think we have always tended to focus more on primary care or on secondary care and not give social care the, con the consideration or thought that it needs. And I think we all need to, realising the issues that will um, come to the fore over the next number of years with a, with a growing population, but also an ageing population, that this is an area that we need to start giving attention to on the scale that we have with, say, for example, reconfiguring our, our hospital services in the way that we've done with um, successive um, pieces of work, including the, 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 the expert panel that, which is looking at this issue at this moment in time. This is something that is going to cause all of us problems in the long term if we don't get to grips with it and starting very soon. Call Mr. Daniel Crossan. Deputy Speaker, um, uh, can I ask the Minister to outline uh, the current position in relation to the Greenfield Residential Care Home in Straban? Uh, uh, there has been some uncertainty in the past in relation to it, and I'd just like some clarification on his current position. Can I welcome the, the member? I'm sure he's been welcomed plenty of times to the House, but I can particularly welcome the, the health questions. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any particular issues around the, the said home in, in Straban, and rather than sort of um, guess at it. I, I will come back to the, the member in writing. I'm not aware of any particular problems at this moment in time or any issues, but I'll confirm that in writing to the member. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister whether he made representations to Four Seasons Healthcare to request they reconsider uh, the closure or the timescale for closure of residential nursing homes? Uh, how many of the residents affected by the closures are still to be re relocated? And for an update on his review of residential and nursing care in Northern Ireland? I think about four questions there, maybe certainly three anyway. Um, in respect, we, we, were, um, we were aware as a department of issues um, with Four Seasons, not least because they were well publicised, in, certainly in the mainland press, uh, around uh, the financial difficulties that that uh, particular organisation was having. Uh, and obviously, officials uh, kept in close contact with Four Seasons um, about um, the possibility of closures, although we weren't aware until I certainly wasn't aware until the day itself that they were announcing the particular seven closures that they, that they were. There had been some indications of, of some potential closures, but there hadn't been anything confirmed until the day that it was announced to, to the press. Um, in respect of, of, of residents who are, are currently in homes, the member, my, my, my information um, is that um, and the member will be, I suspect, particularly interested in the two homes that are in his own constituency, which are being closed. But those, um, my understanding is that all of the residents in those homes are going to be uh, moved successfully, going to be moved to, to other homes, and all have agreed to do that. Um, so, you know, whilst that is far from ideal, and I accept that that is far from ideal, I would rather they were staying in their current homes. That, unfortunately, isn't the case because of the decision taken by Four Seasons. Uh, the board and the, and the trust and the RQIA have worked very closely with Four Seasons to ensure that there is a minimum amount of dis disruption for um, those residents, and, and, and I hope to, to see that uh, continue. Call Mr. Jim Monister. Uh, two months ago, the minister made a useful statement uh, halting the consultation on the closure of statutory care homes. Can he indicate if he's going to totally lift the cloud from over those homes by announcing that there will be no closures? I always worry whenever the member says things that have made a useful statement, but I think on this occasion I, I will agree with him that it was a, a, a good statement. And to be fair, he did congratulate me on the day for making that, that statement. Um, look, I, I think that. Um, I have obviously uh, started a, halted that decision and started a review in respect of the terms of that review have been now agreed between my department uh, and the board. And one of the things that they will be looking at is the issue around reopening those homes for, for new admissions. Uh, and I think that was, that's only right and proper that in that context that that is done. But we should bear in mind, Principal Deputy Speaker, that what the decision that I took was because of the, an uncertainty at that time around the market as a whole. And the places that 
or most of the residents in the Four Seasons homes were, were, were nursing care patients as opposed to residential care homes, which was what the decision that I took was on the basis of. But I think it was right that we froze those decisions at that time and froze those uh, consultations at that time just in case other things happen within the market. Now, thankfully, nothing similar has happened to this point, although I do have some concerns. Certainly, uh, my meeting with the independent sector recently uh, affirmed those concerns. Um, so I think it was only right that we took the decision that we did and included within that is the, uh, a review of whether it is appropriate or not to open those again for, for new admissions. And if that is what comes back out of that analysis, then I will certainly um, make sure that that happens. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical question. Topical question number one has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Conor Murphy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be very much aware of the dismay that has been in the nursing profession in relation to the awarding uh, of the, the, the pay raiser and the effect uh, that, that that has had in, on people leaving the profession and perhaps even on the ability to recruit people into the profession. Has he any plans to try and deal with the issue of the pay raise? On, on the, the, the premise that the member makes around the difficulty in recruiting or the difficulty in, in retaining, I, I haven't seen any evidence which is, affirms those, those arguments. And I, some have made those arguments, but I haven't seen any empirical evidence to back, to back that up. Uh, I mean, and, and sort of to, to put back almost an argument to those who put that argument forward, you know, we do have a situation where, yes, pay in Northern Ireland for nurses is, is a, a little below what it is in other parts of the United Kingdom, but it's about 99 per cent of what it is in other parts of the United Kingdom. Whereas um, average Northern Ireland pay, for example, is 86 per cent of what it is in England. So in that respect, it is keeping in line with um, national pay in a way that many other professions don't. And I, I can understand the concerns that many nurses on the, uh, and other health and social care staff on the front line may have about the pay award that I announced uh, early in the new year. Um, I have to say, in dealing with the unions, uh, and I met them before Christmas, I, I didn't find them in a position where they were prepared to move beyond uh, last year's pay award. Uh, they told me that they weren't mandated to go beyond, also arguing and trying to reopen last year's pay award, which had been paid out to the staff many, many months beforehand. And they wanted me to, uh, their, their pay demand of me, Principal Deputy Speaker, would have cost us £40 million. And the member will know from his experience as a minister that being in a ministerial office is all about making choices, and sometimes that is very difficult choices that you have to. Uh, very, very difficult things that you have to choose between. And £40 million it would have cost to meet that pay demand would have been the entirety of what we're putting into uh, waiting lists and trying to tackle waiting lists in Northern Ireland. And, and in those circumstances, I think making a 1% non-consolidated uh, pay award for those who were at the top of their bands and then making those incremental payments, which are an average of 3.7% for all other staff, was, I think, the appropriate balance in the circumstances, particularly where unions weren't prepared to um, seriously negotiate in any other way. Mr Murphy, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. And of, uh, of course, I agree with him. Negotiations can be difficult, but then negotiations, uh, like politics, are the art of the possible. And I, I think there is a responsibility where there is an impasse to try and meet people. Uh, he, he did quote the figure of £40 million. Pounds, and that contradicts a figure I think some of his officials gave to the Health Committee last week, in which it so sought clarity. So could the Minister confirm the actual figure of the award? I think uh, uh, officials. Uh, we're quoting figures in around £23 million. Pounds. There seems to be some disparity between the two figures. The, the, the reason there, there is a difference is that that, 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 is the co that would have been the cost for a one-year 1% 1 consolidated increase. But the union's pay demand of me was that they wanted to go back over 2014 and do the same for that again. So that would have incurred a cost for last year as well, which would have taken it closer to, to £40 million, And that's why there is, a, 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 I suppose, a perceived difference or discrepancy, as the member described it. Look, and I, I, I don't want to be in a position, I want to be in a, I want to be in a position where I'm working with our, our trade unions to agree on pay awards and pay settlements. And, and you know, I think we're all realistic enough to know that you know, unions will come in and will demand lots of things and, and perhaps not all of those achievable. But I think coming in with a position where they wanted to reopen 2014-15 settlement and weren't, going, weren't prepared to work with me, um, and I, I, I put it on the table there. I, was, I said I, want to, I would be flexible within the budget that I had. Uh, I would look at other terms and conditions which their, the, their counterparts in uh, England and Wales, for example, had negotiated away as part of other pay, pay settlement discussions over there. They weren't prepared to do that. And in those circumstances, I wasn't prepared to wait any longer without giving some certainty to staff. 
But in saying that, particularly with, with our nurses, who, whose, whose contribution to the service I value greatly, I, you know, I look forward to, and I am scheduled to engage with the Royal College of Nursing in the, in the not too distant future. I look forward to working with them, um, to not just on this issue. And I want to, I want to look at this issue of pay and, and moving to the future in respect of pay with them, but also on some of the other, other issues that were raised in, in, in oral questions around shortages of nurses, the need to uh, have uh, training in place, what we can do with bursaries, how we can retain staff. I want to work with our nurses, I want to work with the Royal College of Nursing to, to get a, a positive outcome on those issues and indeed on the, on, on the future in terms of pay. Question number three has been withdrawn. I call Mr Alex Easton. Speaker, um, could I ask the Health Minister, as he knows, the Health Committee have been scrutinising the Human Transplant Bill, Plantation Bill. Has the Minister any view on um, any of the evidence that has been given by the clinicians to the Committee so far? Yeah, I, I know that the, the Committee has been um, scrutinising this, this bill now for the, for the last number of weeks. And, and since, um, and I thank the Committee for, for the, the work that it has done, it has been, I think, useful scrutiny of this particular piece of, of legislation. Since, since coming into this post, others have encouraged me, and I have made it crystal clear, Principal Deputy Speaker, that I will always be guided by science and the evidence and the views of, of our clinicians. And I think it is significant in respect of this piece of legislation, this Human Transplantation Bill, that the clinical voice has almost been as, as one. I think it has, it has been as one in respect of the concerns that many have about the bill as currently drafted, that it would not have, there's no certainty that it would have the desired effect of increasing organ donation rates in Northern Ireland. And there is indeed a real concern amongst transplant surgeons and a real concern amongst ICU um, clinicians who give evidence to the committee that it could have a detrimental effect on organ donations. I don't think there's anybody in the House who wants to see any piece of legislation going through that has, does a detriment to something that is so important. I think it is, it is significant as well that you know, we, we, we are faced as legislators with any number of organisations, even in the health sphere, people who are on the clinical front line coming to us and saying, you need to make a change in the law here because that will improve things. It is significant that not a single clinician has come to me and said, that they want us to make the change that has been suggested in this piece of legislation. And whilst I know the intentions of the legislation are good, I think we need to be incredibly careful, listen to what the clinicians are saying clearly and with one voice before rushing to make what could be bad legislation. Call Mr Easton for supplementary. Um, could I thank the Minister so far for his answer? Uh, could I ask the Minister what discussions has the Minister had with clinicians uh, about improving transplant services across Northern Ireland? Yeah, well, as, as, as you would expect, and I, I, I do speak to clinicians in this field and indeed others on a, on a regular basis um, about how we can improve whatever the services might be, and in particular respect of, of transplant services in Northern Ireland. I think we have, a, we have a real success story to tell in Northern Ireland about how particularly live donor rates have increased significantly over the last number of, of years. Um, uh, and I think that, it, that is testimony to everybody in the system, but particularly the team operating in the, the transplant centre in, in the city hospital. Um, and they have, they're an impressive group of people who openly tell you that they want to be the best in the world at what they do. And that's not something that in Northern Ireland we're often prone to say that we want to be the best in the world at something. But they're very clear that that's what their ambition is. And I have been having discussions with them, which I then had uh, followed up with discussions with the Irish Health Minister around the possibility of um, opening up transplantation to something that could happen on a, a more on a, on a cross-border basis. Uh, I think there are opportunities to address some, um, careful in my language, some deficiencies perhaps in, in the Irish system could be addressed by some of the successes in Northern Ireland, uh, and in doing so in a way that would enhance the experience for uh, patients on both sides of, of our border. Um, and uh, I think that anything like that which is uh, going to improve the service because it's something wor worth exploring. It's something that I've already had a conversation with the Irish Health Minister about uh, and want to see followed up um, at official level in the not-too-distant future. I call Mr Peter Weir. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, I'm sure he'll be aware of comments that have been made in terms of the scale of the health budget by the BMA recently. I'll ask him maybe to uh, give us his views on the budget settlement for the Department for 2016-17. Thank, thank the member for, for his question. Um, 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the, uh, I, I did notice the, the comments from, from the BMA, and I think it's probably understandable that um, they would always be pushing for more investment within within health. Um, I just, you know, I, I think that the, the settlement um, that my department received, which is an increase of 130 million pounds, nearly a three percent increase in expenditure uh, in the department for next year, is, a, is a, an incredibly good settlement in what are very challenging budgetary circumstances. And, and could, could we spend more? Yes, we could. Could we, could we spend double that? Absolutely. We could we spend treble or, or quadruple what, what we have got. But that isn't the point. We are living in very confined, very difficult financial circumstances. And for, for my department to get a 3% increase means that other departments have to make much bigger sacrifices. And the member will be well aware of sacrifices that many departments are making, some facing 5% reductions in their budget. And I think to, in, even in those very difficult circumstances, for the executive to agree a budget which increases health expenditure by, by 3%, I think is, underscores the commitment that this executive has made to health over the last number of years, where we have seen huge additional in, injections of, of resources into the department at a time whenever there have been immense pressures elsewhere within the system. I call Mr Weir for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his response. Uh, moving, I suppose, beyond simply the the current financial year to the more strategic direction of the next assembly term, um, what level of increase in funding does the minister believe needs to happen during the next assembly term? Well, I, I, think, there, I think it does need to be uh, an increase, uh, a significant increase in expenditure in the Department of Health of, over the next five years. But I think we need to be again, mindful of the fact that, that other departments will have to make sacrifices to allow that to happen. I see my, my colleague, the Minister for Social Development, looking at me worryingly about making sacrifices in other departments. Um, but you know, I think we do need to be mindful of that fact. I don't think some within the system are quite mindful enough. I mean, we can talk about demand rising at, at huge percentage levels every year, but you know, we cannot simply. You know, it, is, it is very, very difficult to meet that sort of level of demand with additional commensurate uh, increases in resources. Um, but I think we also have to, and this is where driving forward with reforms and transformation that makes the system more efficient and also more sustainable is incredibly important. If I or whoever is the health minister in the future goes to the finance minister to make a case for more money for health, then they've got to do so on the basis of that this is going to, one, improve outcomes for people in Northern Ireland, that's the most important thing, but is also going into a system that is going to be more efficient and will help to make that system more efficient. I think that is the sort of argument that any sensible health minister should be making to a finance minister. In terms of what I think needs to be done, having looked at the system, having looked at demand and where it is increasing, but also the need for investment uh, in um, the front line and also in reform and transformation. I have already been on public records, and I think that over the next five years, the Department of Health needs uh, another billion pounds to be spent on it. Uh, we have already got 130 million of that. I will be making, or I'm sure the Minister, I'm sure, whoever it is, will be making bids in the June monitoring line for further to go into that system. But we need that sort of a level of investment to ensure that services are maintained at their current level, but that we are also spending money, which is sometimes difficult uh, to do on transforming our services with some experience of that being difficult in the past, but I want to make sure that there is a ring-fenced amount of money going specifically into transformation and change every single year so that we can make the service more sustainable in the future. Call Mr Sean Rogers. Minister, in December 2013, the Trust told us that any proposed reduction in emergency care at Down Hospital would be temporary. On the 30th of September this year, I asked you for an update on those services, an answer I haven't received. I'm not, not so worried it's an answer I haven't received, but it's an answer to the 20,000 people who stood on the streets of Downpatrick a year ago in February, coming in February want, want to know. And what I'm asking you now is what steps are being taken to address these temporary closures to, to alleviate the fears of the people of South Down? Can I, can I say, look, I, I'll, I'll follow up why the, the member hasn't got the answer to, to the question that he's asked. Um, can say some, sometimes this, the issue of the, the Down Hospital is characterised as a South Down issue because of where the hospital is located, but the member will be well aware that it serves many constituents of, of mine. Um, and, you know, I, I can, my family from the area and family still in the area, and I know the, the special place that the Down Hospital, particularly the old Down Hospital, but also the, the new Down Hospital has in, in the hearts of local people. And, you know, the member will be, will be aware of the issues that there have been, not just in Northern Ireland, but UK-wide in, in terms of recruiting and retaining emergency department staff and consultants in emergency departments, and it's something which has affected other uh, hospitals that serve his constituency as well. 
and every effort is made to try to ensure that we keep staff. Every effort, I know from, from speaking to trust chief executives, they, in, in all parts of Northern Ireland, make every effort to retain staff, but it, it is incredibly difficult to retain, retain staff in some of our smaller hospitals that are further away from Belfast. Now, you know, I, I, would have, I don't think that is an acceptable position to be in, um, but I also find, and, 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 but the fact that you, know, you always hear this argument about it being closer to Belfast, but we have difficulty even sometimes in recruiting to emergency departments inside Belfast as well, and we have seen some examples of that in recent times. So every effort has been made to try to retain and also recruit new staff into these areas. But, but on, in respect of the Down Hospital itself, it is not a hospital that is under threat, and I have made it absolutely clear that it has an incredibly important role to play within the trust area. Now, some people in the area, and maybe the member himself and others, might want it to be pro providing services at a particular level, but we have to provide those services to ensure that the highest quality and safety to, pa to the patients is ensured. And I do not want to do anything that would compromise the quality of the service that people receive or indeed the safety of the service that they get either. Time is up. That concludes questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety.